Hi, I'm Malika Bilal. And I'm Ahmed Shabuddin, and you're in the stream. Today, who will win the new race to the moon? Space agencies and private companies are eager to bring humans and their plans for development to the next frontier. So do you have any questions about moon exploration? Well, if you do, share them with us via Twitter or in our live YouTube chat. Hi, my name is Katie Mack. I'm an astrophysicist at the North Carolina State University, and you are in the stream. As 2019 marks 50 years since the United States put the first men on the moon, space agencies and private companies are calling for a renewed era of lunar exploration. In January, China became the first nation to successfully send a lunar probe to study the far side of the moon. And last week, the U.S. space agency NASA announced its accelerated timeline to build the first lunar orbit outpost and put the first woman on the moon by 2024. Other nations, including India, have plans for their own lunar landers that will examine the moon's southern pole. So what's behind the renewed momentum in bringing humans back to the moon? Well, with us to discuss all of this from St. Louis, Missouri, Ryan Watkins. She is a research scientist with the Planetary Science Institute and a member of the advisory board to the aerospace company Blue Origin. From The Hague in the Netherlands, Bernard Foink, a senior scientist at the European Space Agency, also known as ESA, and the executive director of the International Lunar Exploration Working Group. And in New York, last but not least, Robin Seamangle, a journalist and director of content for Supercluster. Now that's a website focused on stories about space. So good to have all of you here in the stream. Thanks for being here. So I want to start with this tweet because it really lays it all out here for why we're talking about <laughs> this topic. This is from the Johnson Space Center, NASA, the U.S. Space Agency. 2024, we are going and we are going to stay. Have a look at the promotional video behind that idea. 50 years ago, we pioneered a path to the moon. The trail we blazed cut through the fictions of science and showed us all what was possible. It's very pretty out here. Today, our calling to explore is even greater. To go farther, we must be able to sustain missions of greater distance and duration. We must use the resources we find at our destinations. We must overcome radiation, isolation, gravity, and extreme environments like never before. These are the challenges we face to push the bounds of humanity. We're going to the moon to stay by 2024. To stay, kind of ominous, but kind of exciting. Bernard, talk to us about what you think is behind this new impetus to get back to the moon and, 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 and to, to make that push for lunar exploration. Hello, welcome from the moon. <laughs> I'm there. Yeah, the moon, our eight continent. And why do we want to go forward to the moon? We want to go forward to the moon for peace, for science, for technology. We want to also go there to make business, to exploit resources and inspire the public, educate uh, the kids that will be the future moonwalkers and start a new renaissance from Earth's cradle to the moon because we are part of an Earth-Moon double planet system. Huh. And uh, so we have a lot of things to, to do there. We want to engage everybody, everybody. So it's not only for the scientists, for the engineers, it's for all countries. And uh, we want to have all ages and all discipline because we, inhabitants of the Earth, we can be part of this moon village. 7.5 billion people should be involved now. And uh, we, we have, um, okay, I had a chance to send some probe. I was the father of a little baby that uh, I sent to the moon uh, some 10 years ago called Smart One. We have got some new maps of the moon. We have found places there where there is water. We have found places where there is a, a peak of eternal light. So mm -hmm. now we can next step. So I hear, the, I hear the enthusiasm in your voice. Yes. I love that. Yeah. You mentioned several things that we're going to delve into today in the show. But that first, the eighth continent of the world. So Ryan, you hear the enthusiasm in Bernard's voice. What do you make of this, this push? Why are we going to the moon? No, I, I would definitely agree with everything that Bernard just said. Um, I would also add to that, um, we're going... Uh, not only to stay on the moon, to use the resources to explore, to learn science, but we're also going to get to Mars. Uh, so a lot of you know, people in the lunar community, you'll hear them say it's not the moon or Mars, it's the moon and Mars. Uh, so we're going to the moon to learn how we can live and work in space in order to go um, beyond 
the Earth Moon system. And you know, I, hearing you say that just reminds me of some of the conversations we had as we were preparing for the show, which is echoed right now in our live chat as well as on Twitter. Um, I want you to answer this, Robin, if you can. Sammy's saying there's a lot of money put into the space program, but the public has never informed on what's going on. Why not? And is there a way for citizens to find out? Then we have another tweet from Being Charlie, putting it perhaps a little bit more simply, billionaires racing to cash in on the latest space race. Um, what do you make of that, Robin? Is this about money as much as curiosity and anything else? Absolutely. Um, I think that's what's driving the commercial space industry. Um, if there wasn't money to be made, there wouldn't be any innovation right now. Um, and I think that the innovations that we've seen in reusability and what both Blue Origin and SpaceX are doing um, by reducing costs is making this possible. Um, in terms of the public knowing about what the space industry is doing, uh, we need more space journalists. We need more coverage of what's going on. We, we need more science communicators. We need more STEM outreach on the uh, grassroots level. So I think there's a lot of things we can do to inform the public. And an informed public actually helps the space program because then they write letters to their congressmen, their senators. They call for space exploration. It's a really important facet mm. of getting funding. Mm -hmm. So let's help yeah, educate. Clearly, uh, go ahead. Let's help educate the, the public yeah, right now. But uh, it's, not only, it's not only money. I mean, money, I mean, it's, a, it's a mean to do what we want to do. And we want to do to uh, incentivize the, the kids' curiosity. We want to have uh, uh, people that uh, learn, that look at about science and empower everybody to do more science, more technology. And OK, uh, uh, invest money and maybe we will get benefits. Money will exploit resources. But as a society, we'll make progress all together. And that's, I think, that the biggest resources we could do with lunar exploration. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the brain that we have all over the world that uh, we can inspire to do, innovate, to do things that uh, looking at the moon, but also investing it in our, uh, on our Earth as well. Mm -hmm. So I have to agree uh, with Bernard and mm -hmm. just say that exploring the moon and building the architecture to get there and the infrastructure to stay there it's like building the internet. You're allowing a new platform for new startups, new entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. um, yeah. students, and just about anybody who wants to get involved with space exploration, they now have that platform to go do so. And that's what's important about settling on the moon. Mm -hmm. So I want to get a little geeky right here for the science nerds in our audience and also just for the, the general public so we know scientifically what it is that we have to explore. Ryan, talk to us about some of the unanswered questions that we still have from uh, the last trip to the moon. What is there left that we don't know about? Mm -hmm. What is there left to learn scientifically? Yeah, uh, well, we could spend um, several episodes talking just about that question, um, but kind of some high level things that we haven't answered. Um, there's a lot we still don't know about the different types of volcanism on the moon. Uh, there's a lot we don't know about the impact history, uh, the age of different basins, which um, if we can get that kind of information, we can know a lot about the impact history, not only of the moon, but of, of Earth and the inner solar system. And by um, impact history, you mean, mm -hmm. so what, these were asteroids or these were, mm -hmm. these were explosions or these were um, hits on the moon? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, asteroids um, impacting the moon. Um, you know, at, over what time frames has that happened? Um, have there been spikes in, in the impact history throughout history um, throughout the moon's history? Um, there, you know, there's a lot. You know, there's recent discoveries of, of water ice on the moon, um, but we don't know what forms of this water is in. You know, is it is it you know the solid ice beneath the surface? Is it mixed in with the soil on the moon? We, we don't know. Um, and these are just you know a couple of things. You know, we could hit on topics. Uh, regarding the lunar atmosphere and the interior of the moon, uh, the, the actual regolith. There's just a, so much we don't actually know, um, and we need mm -hmm. to go back to answer all of these questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's and true. It's the last the, 15 years. We, we sent some probes, and uh, we made new discoveries. We had old questions, and we found uh, new questions. Uh, indeed, uh, we found uh, uh, volatiles in the poles of the moon, but uh, also we found uh, uh, new volcanism. And so clearly, science of the moon will be key to understand better, for instance. So just very the, briefly, uh, Bernard, sorry, uh, very briefly, because this word has come up twice. Yeah, Volcanism. Yes, what, yeah, so what science that of the moon is a key. And uh, Brian summarized it well. But uh, also in the future, we are going to take samples from the moon. And another aspect, we are going to do science from the moon, put telescope to observe the beginning of the universe, look for extraterrestrial civilization. 
And also we do science on the moon. We bring life from Earth to the surface of the moon. So uh, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. Oh, Robin, to answer your question about volcanism, um, so volcanism on the moon isn't quite the same as what you might think about volcanism on the Earth. You know, there's there's no large volcanoes sitting on the surface spewing lava. Um, and the moon's not what we consider active, so there's no volcanism currently taking place. Uh, however, if you look up at the moon, um, you know, you, you often see kind of light and dark um, features. Uh, in the dark are the, the solidified um, lava flows or, or basalts. Uh, so that's kind of the, the main type of volcanism you see. This is generally lava flows that have welled up from inside of the moon um, and, and solidified mm -hmm. on the surface. But there, there's all sorts of different types. There, there's some explosive, explosive volcanic products on the moon. There's areas that are um, silicic or, or not as iron rich as typical basalts like you might see um, on the you know, near side of the moon or Hawaii, for example, to put yeah. a terrestrial analog. Um, so there's a lot of questions about um, the duration of volcanism. When did it happen? What types are there? What kind of materials were produced? Um, so that's kind of what we mean the, by volcanism. And I think the focus of Go ahead. Uh, this recent uh, rush back to the moon is sort of focused on the South Pole. And uh, because of the Indian mission, uh, the Chandrayaan mission, uh, Chandrayaan one mission, over the last decade, we've had a really good look at the South Pole of the Moon. And what scientists are discovering there is that there's ice beneath the surface. Now we don't know if that ice is filled with regolith, and we don't know if that ice is in solid rock form. But we currently don't have the technology to well to mine that ice because we don't know how to mine it yet mm. but there and we yeah. need to study this ice but that could be a resource for fuel mm -hmm. for oxygen <laughs> just for general life support but i think mm -hmm. uh going back to what ryan was saying about volcanism very important aspect um uh, relating to this terrain and when it comes to the terrain of the south pole especially it's far rougher than what Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked around on mm -hmm. far rougher. And remember, yeah. it's on a permanent tilt, so it's dark and mm -hmm. it's cold. And it, I don't think it ever gets above minus 250 degrees. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah. yeah, you're, yeah you're, you're, you're making that sound very enticing, very enticing. <laughs> yeah, so, Robin, here's it, it, if we could take a step back. I mean, there's a lot of people talking about how incredible this all is. Obviously, space exploration is exciting, even for those of us who don't understand the intricate inner workings of it. Elizabeth Rainey on uh, our YouTube live chat asking this question, admitting that the space race is an amazing achievement for all humans, but saying, I hope it doesn't become another form of colonization. And this has been echoed even on Twitter by a lot of people saying, seeing as how we've already trashed this planet from the immediate space around it to the deepest parts of the ocean, why should we as an obviously subpar species be allowed to leave our <laughs> trash heap and go destroy someplace else? You talk about needing to exploit resources. Uh, Ber Bernard, wh what, would yeah, you answer? Right. what would you answer to yeah. these people concerned? So we go forward to the moon, but we do it a new way. We do it in a sustainable way for all future generations, for humankind, and even for the rest of life on Earth. And uh, so we have to go there, first uh, step, to see what is there, characterize the environment, and then we go with robots, but uh, also in a very, uh, 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 with respect for what is there. And so we are going eventually, okay, the poles are amazing place. We, we have like one billion ton of water. We could use maybe just a very tiny fraction to start with uh, human, to get fuel, uh, to bootstrap uh, interplanetary economy, but we do it with respect. Mm -hmm. And also there are some areas we could use for a settlement, uh, but uh, other areas, we also protect them for the future, like we do with Antarctica. Mm. So you're saying that this time we'll do it better, we'll do it right. I, I want to share with all of you um, a little clip from Amazon CEO and Blue Origin founder Jeff Bezos. Now, this is on May 9th, and he was unveiling his plans for returning humans to the moon. And he was also agreeing with the Trump administration's push to do this all within the next five years. Have a look. Vice President Pence just recently said, it's the stated policy of this administration and the United States of America to return American astronauts to the moon within the next five years. I love this. It's the right thing to do. It's time to go back to the moon, this time to stay. So he loves it. Take a look here. You see, you see the, the web page for Blue Origin, uh, and they are working on a robotic lunar lander called Blue Moon. So, Ryan, take us through this. Are you as excited as Jeff Bezos is, or are you worried at all? Because the next five years sounds 
too soon. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely, I would say I'm as excited as he is, if not more, because I have been in the lunar community for a while and um, I would love to have, you know, my own Apollo to see humans back on the moon. Um, things I'm concerned about, uh, the timing is really short. I'm not saying we can't do it, but there's a lot of infrastructure that still needs to be in place. Um, we need to have a rocket that's ready to go. We need to have a lander that's ready to go. Uh, we need to have astronauts who are who are trained not only to fly these things, but trained in, in field geology and, and how to actually do science once they're on the moon and how to exploit the resources. Uh, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done, um, but I think it's very feasible. Um, I'm excited to see all of the excitement from the administration and the commercial Board. companies. It's great. <laughs> so, so I know you're excited, and you know there are many optimists who are chiming into this conversation. I, I don't want to be too negative, but because there are some critics on Twitter who are for now saying, listen, trying to put a caveat on his previous tweet, saying, don't get me wrong. I mean, I want us to eventually be a space-faring species. I'm enamored with the universe. However, I work from a place of realism. Our species has not not earned the right to go permanently off planet. We need to clean up our messes here before we explore there. Robin, you're nodding. Um, there's another tweet from Kyle William Marston, and this is what we love to see when a conversation happens online, saying, replying to him, saying, while I totally respect your view, I remain an optimist, but also a pessimist. I think humanity shouldn't go extinct, and to ensure that happens, we need to be a space-faring species. Um, what do you think, Robin? I mean, is that a fair criticism that there I are... Think, um, yeah, go ahead. Those, both these individuals are correct. And... Um, and my answer for that is I think that space can help us start to fix ourselves here on Earth, too. I think it's, um, you know, we've all, over the past decade, we've looked to the Internet, we've looked to social media as the great uniter, and it's turned out not to be. But I think in space exploration, if we can make it cheap and if we can make it accessible to the everyday person. I think there's a new frontier to be explored. There's new technology to be made. And I think it's, there's going to be an even playing field. Mm -hmm. I think, on this new frontier, and it will be a great uniter. Mm. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I'd like so to, I love that optimism as well, um, but yeah. I also am kind of still chuckling at the, the person who tweeted and called humans a subpar species. Yeah. Of so I wanted to put this to your attention. Um, this from the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. The Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration and Use of Outer Space. Now, in 1967, um, countries around the world agreed to a set of rules on governing exploration and using space. And one of those things was that it was supposed to be free for exploration and for use only for peaceful purposes. Exactly. So you see headlines like this. Mm -hmm. This is from uh, Defense One. Pentagon wants to test a space-based weapon in 2023. Mm -hmm. That's on one side of that, that, that spectrum. On the yeah. other side, though, just, just, just today, yeah. uh, this headline dropped. Pakistan and <laughs> Russia signed joint statement on no first placement of weapons in outer space. This is from the international news. Bernard, you're trying to jump in there. Yeah. Weapons yeah, in I space. Mean, Go for it. This is a law. We, all the countries agreed that the moon is a continent of peace. There is no, you cannot have military activities on the moon. You cannot have weapon of mass destruction. You cannot have uh, also property of the moon to, and then you will avoid conflict of territory. But and this, all the countries have signed to this treaty. But Bernard, if, 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 but Bernard no, no disrespect. I just want to quickly push back on that. I mean, you could yeah. say many countries here on Earth have signed many treaties and then violated no, no, them just, here on Earth. Hold on. They violated yeah. them here on Earth. So what's to suggest that they won't do the same uh, on the moon? Well, this is a, this is a very good treaty because uh, this, uh, this was signed in a time of, any, of conflict and they found it was the best way uh, to have... Uh, uh, the space for peaceful purposes, because then you mostly do economical development, technology, curiosity. And, you know, like on the International Space Station, it's a place of peace between countries which have now a tension conflict. Space is used uh, for uh, exchange, for, yeah. for knowledge, and also for, for peace. So mm -hmm. I think until now, the countries have signed that have ratified this uh, treaty, uh, keep to it, uh, even the... Uh, okay, the so U.S., China, all of them, and so let's keep this treaty. Robin, sure. but I need I need to point out that if this is coming from the United Nations, the U.N. barely has the ability to enforce its laws and regulations here on the planet. I don't see them. I don't see these treaties being upheld, and um, mm -hmm. I can tell you right now there. I don't know if you can really define them as offensive weapons, but there's defensive weapons uh, in the form of satellites and experimental technology being launched to orbit right now without the permission of anybody. 
And yeah, I no, just feel like uh, when uh, it comes to you this, should read the law. The, re the law allows to do it in near space around Earth, but it's forbidden right. on the moon. So the moon is really a continent of peace. So when we explore the moon, we start with a peaceful approach. Ber from Bernard, I want to believe everything yeah. you're saying, and I really do. Yeah. And, and so I am oh, going no. to for this moment. No, I am. I think okay. it makes sense. Yeah. Why not? But I do have yeah. a question that's coming in uh, yeah. in our live YouTube chat. Maybe, Ryan, you can answer this. He Tendra Rather saying, wait a minute, who has authority over the moon? No, no one. No one has that authority. I mean, there is this treaty that's been signed, but essentially no one owns the moon. Um, you know, the U.S. has gone to the moon. We've planted flags, but we don't own that soil beneath, you know, the mm -hmm. landers there. Uh, so no one owns it. Mm -hmm. No one really, truly has that authority. It's just like Bernard said, it's 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 a peaceable place. We hope that yeah. everyone who who plans to send a lander or a spacecraft to the moon uh, does it with, with the intention of, of exploring and learning and um, you know, getting humans out but, uh, beyond Earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you so, don't need to know to own it because, for instance, the deep sea, nobody owns it, but you can go fishing there. So on <laughs> the moon, without ownership, you still have the authority to deploy a tool there to, to, to fish or to exploit the resources. And then after we have to discuss how we distribute the benefit of these resources. So that's an interesting debate. Uh, do we, can we use it also for the rest of the world or what part? you keep for the one that is investing in putting the tool on the so, moon. So, Bernard, you actually have a retirement plan. You, you're thinking of... <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, about the, that. at the moment, we are working on a moon village, a, a robotic village, and then we put a moon base. And in 20 years, I plan to retire on the moon. And so, I have a house. So as you're talking, we're going we're gonna to take a look at the animations from the European Space Agency yeah. and this proposal yeah, so, for uh, moon village so, that you're talking about. So talk us through yeah. why this excites yeah. you. Why does this not scare you to death? Yeah, we have a module. So with a lander that we have uh, designed, uh, we'll go first in orbit. And uh, here we have looked at uh, mm -hmm. uh, some habitat. We start with modules and then we inflate some structures. We protect them with a 3D uh, printed structure that are elaborated by a robot. And then we come uh, with humans. So this will leave some of the first astronauts to do. Um, in 10 years, we'll have uh, some 10 astronauts around. This is uh, the, near the peak of it and light, Shackleton Crater. And uh, so now, based on the experience that we have acquired from the International Space Station, we will uh, use uh, um, uh, the surface of the moon as also a different place. It's a place where different partners can build Mm. Uh, some uh, so, habitat, some landers, and here we have a robot that is 3D printed, printing a kind of honeycomb structure which is very light and then can protect some inflatable uh, housing that uh, we can deploy. And uh, it's a bit accelerated so, here as the robot will take uh, a few <laughs> months to build all this. But, looks, uh, you uh, sold us. I think, I think you might have sold us. It, right. it will be ready for use. And okay, so, after a few years, so I'll Bernard, be there and I to but, welcome you on the surface of the moon. Well, I hope so, we'll Bernard. Take that up. But, but a quick question, just to snap back to reality. Robin, uh, we have a tweet from Najib Kalungi saying, all states venturing to the lunar surface are nuclear powers. Doesn't this make sense to someone here? And a lot of the other tweets asking about why it's single nations working on this rather than working together. Your thoughts quickly, Robin? I don't think it's single nations. Uh, yes, uh, mm -hmm. the nations may be covering a lot of the cost, but these kinds of missions, whether it be the moon or Mars, um, require the efforts of universities, res uh, research companies, private companies, manufacturers, people who train astronauts. Um, you know, there, this is an international effort, and I think um, we're not seeing the many pieces connecting right now. Mm -hmm. But when it comes time to go to Mars, the first humans, uh, yeah. there will be an international effort. Everybody's going to have their hands in it. It'll be a crew of Roscosmos, JAXA, NASA, e ESA astronauts. Um, it's mm -hmm. going to be the most expensive thing, and it's going to be the most complex thing we've ever done. Mm -hmm. So going back to the moon, going back to Mars, uh, no matter how, mu how much conflict there is and how, how much a conflict of interest, right. everyone's going to have their fingers in the pie. Right. So Robin, we shall see. Robin, I have to leave it there. Robin, Bernard, and Ryan, thank you so much for being part of this discussion today. That's all the time we have for now, but the conversation, as always, will continue online at AJ Stream. Thanks for watching.